greetings to all of our listeners and viewers as we uh, have another presentation. This time, our topic will be lessons from the life of King Hezekiah. So let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. We commit this program into your hands. We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit that we can have understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. King Hezekiah was the 13th king of Judah. And this was at a time where Israel had uh, divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom comprised of ten tribes and the southern kingdom uh, called Judah and which had only two tribes and their capital was at Jerusalem. So Hezekiah, he reigned from he reigned for 29 years from 715 BC to 686 BC. Now, uh, what kind of king was he? Second Kings chapter 18 verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So this king is exceptional in, in how he was loyal to God. And I would say most of the time. Okay, looking at his background, his great-grandfather was King Uzziah, and his grandfather was King Jotham. And they were godly and wise men who had increased Judah's prosperity and influence to levels unknown since the days of David and Solomon. Then Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, through evil practices and poor leadership, lost all that the two previous generations had gained and lost national sovereignty as well, leaving Judah a vassal of Assyria. So under Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, uh, Judah lost their independence and they became so, a sort of colony, a sort of vessel of the Assyrian Empire. Now, King Hezekiah came to the throne after his father's disasters and with the memory of the glory days of his grandfather, King Jotham, who still reigned when Hezekiah was a child. So Hezekiah remembered the good times during the time of his grandfather, okay, when Israel was still on the up, but uh, then when his father followed Israel, uh, Judah started going down, rightly concluding that these hardships had come upon Judah because they had abandoned the Lord. Hezekiah instituted the most sweeping religious reforms of all the kings before or after him. As a result, during his 29-year reign, he was successful in everything he did no small accomplishment given the very difficult times during which he reigned. So Hezekiah rightly concluded that the reason for the downfall of Judah was because of disobedience to God's law. Second Chronicles 29 verse 6, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Verse 10. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Verse 29. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Verse 35. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. So Hezekiah was determined to remedy the situation. He determined that Israel should come back to the worship of the God of heaven. 
All right. Isaiah 36 verse 1. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is threatening Judah. Let's read it. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. Then Rabshakeh, and this man is uh, Sennacherib's spokesman, stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. And it's interesting what uh, this, uh, this man is, uh, his message, you know. He's telling, he's trying to discourage the people of Judah. He said, don't listen to your king. And also, he's telling them not to trust in their God. Somehow he's got a, an inkling. Somehow he knows that the strength of Israel is present when they trust in God. And so he's trying their best. He says, don't trust in your king, don't trust in your God. Verse 16, Isaiah chapter 36. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me and eat ye every one of his vine and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And so he continues uh, trying to persuade Judah just to submit meekly to their intrusion. Okay? So, all right. Now, this threatening done by the Assyrians was a strong cause of fear. In fact, the women in, in Judah were so scared they didn't have strength to deliver their babies. That's how, how, how scared they were. Uh, you find this in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring forth. So the woman was so scared they didn't have, uh, they couldn't even deliver their babies. So when King Hezekiah was threatened, the first thing he did was to go into the house of the Lord. We find this in 2 Kings 19 verse 1. And this is something that we can learn from. And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. So friends, one positive thing this king did was to go seek counsel of the Lord straight away. Uh, for us, you know, human nature, when there's a crisis, we run around, run around, looking, you know, run to earthly institutions, run to other people for help, uh, and so on. And then when finally everything, you know, we hit a brick wall, and then we turn to the Lord. Hezekiah, no, other way, he goes straight for the Lord and ask for help. All right, verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. So the king sent his uh, servants to say, go to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah said unto them, thus shall ye say to your master, thus saith the Lord, 
Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria hath blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So the prophet Isaiah reassures King Hezekiah's servants. He says, go tell your master. Don't, don't be don't be frightened. Don't be scared. Um, he will hear rumor. The king will withdraw. And then he's going to be assassinated in his own land. And that's exactly how it turned out. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see that later. So 2 Kings 19 verse 14. And Hezekiah received. So after the spokesman had delivered his threatening message to the people of Judah, then write one letter, and give the letter, okay? And Hezekiah took the letter and he went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Verse 15, 2 Kings chapter 19. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thy thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria hath destroyed the nations and their land. So Hezekiah is praying to God and he's, he's, he's quite a detailed conversation. He's telling God what the kings of Assyria have done. And uh, it might seem strange. I mean, God already know what's taking place. He knows everything. But uh, uh, King Hezekiah is praying anyway. Because that's how you open. That's how you commune with God. That's how you open your heart to God. And so he's spilling it all out. Pouring out his heart. Second Kings 19 verse 19. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. And so we see here the motive of King Hezekiah in this time of peril and danger. He is interested in the glory of God, that no shame may, may be brought to the name of God. So he say, destroy them. Get rid of our enemies so that all the kingdoms of the earth, you know, will know that you are the true God. All right. Verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Friends, this one huge death toll, 185,000 okay, in one night were smitten and the Judah and, and, and the people of Judah didn't even have to fight. All they did was just pray to the Lord and the Lord fought the battle for them. That's another good encouraging lesson, friends, for God's people today. 
because for God's people today, those who stand for truth, they'll be in the firing line. Okay. They'll be threatened from all angles. The world don't like the truth. Okay. And so we can be reassured that the same God who protected his people in that day will, can do the same for his people today. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adremelik and Shereza, his son, smote him with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Eshadon, his son, reigned in his stead. And so that was, that was it. He's down and out now. King Sennacherib, after that huge death toll, when his army, all his soldiers were destroyed, 185,000, he went back in shame to his own land, and then he was assassinated by his own son. Beware when you touch, when you go against God's people, you're touching the apple of his eye. Psalms 34 verse 17, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Verse 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as to be of a contrite spirit. Second Chronicles 20 verse 15, we see the same sort of scenario was played out in the time of King Jehoshaphat, another king of Judah. Verse 15, And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Friends, King Jehoshaphat, he also was threatened by invasion from his enemies and the, God, and, and the same God who delivered Hezekiah also delivered him. Okay? And God told him, be not afraid. This is not your war. This, this is my battle. Leave it to me. Romans 12 verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And so friends here, you see God's people, when they're in a bind, when it's crisis time, they don't have to fight. I mean, when Jesus was, was captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter tried to draw his sword and, you know, defend Jesus. He actually cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus picked it up, stuck it back on again. And he told Peter, hey, you know, I can just call like this. Legions of angels come down to do the fighting for us. He said, Put your sword back. And... Uh, so we see here, you know, how the love that God has for his people, when it is needed, he's going to defend them. All right, so Isaiah 38 verse 1, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Okay, so so God delivered the, his people from the Assyrian army. And then as time went on, then Hezekiah became sick. By the way, he was around about 39 years old when this happened. And it was a fatal sickness sick unto death, and God sent Isaiah, go, go tell him, set his house in order, for 
because he's going to die. You know, call a family meeting, explain what's what's all going to happen, your your desires, you know, uh, who inherit who and who's, you know, who's going to be the next king and all that type of stuff so that there's no disruption. Uh, and, and this is actually a good thing, you know, uh, for, for those who remain, for the family members, for the country and all, uh, put, you know, organize everything before his death. Uh, uh, however, Hezekiah didn't want to die, and which is quite natural. I mean, most of us, if we know we're going to die, man, we're going to fight tooth and nail to live a bit longer. So anyway, he turns his face toward the wall and he starts crying to God and praying to God. He said, Lord, you know, remember me. I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have then done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He didn't want to die. But God told him, hey, you know, get everything in order. You're going to die now. Now see, friends, when God decides something for us, when he makes a move, we can be assured it is the best move. However, God is flexible. And Hezekiah would, be, uh, and he would uh, accommodate Hezekiah and say, all right, we'll, uh, okay, don't, we, we, we'll, we'll change that, you know. Don't die now, we'll give you another 15 years. Anyway, Isaiah 38 verse 4, Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. So Isaac, Isaiah delivered his message, All right, you're going to die organized everything, and he went out, and he was walking out, crossing the courtyard. Then the message came from God, go back again, he's crying, you know, I've seen his tears, let's give him another 15 years. Uh, friends, when you, when we look at life in this world, it's only temporary. Uh, you know, the, the measure of a life is not how long it is, but it's the quality, how many people you help. If, if, if you live only 39 years and then you die, that can be a better life than someone who lives for 80 years and he's just only concerned with self, not serving others, not helping others. And the 39 years is a much better life than the 80-year life. Okay, But anyway... Human nature, we just want to live. We don't want to die. Okay? So God say, get, tell Isaiah, take one lump of figs, put it on his boil, and then he recovered. Uh, let's give him another 15 years. Second Kings 20 verse 8, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day. Hezekiah, even though the prophet has already told him, all right, you'll be here, we'll give you another 15 days, he want to make sure. He, he's, he's shaken now. He says, sir, this thing, I'm really going to be healed or not. Uh, show me a sign. And Isaiah said, this sign shalt thou have of the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? So, so you see, in those days, they didn't have clocks like that. We like what we have today. You hang on the wall, you know? No, those days they had the sundial and there'd be a rock or some kind of pillar, vertical, and they'd mark the, the area around it uh, they, they mark it in degrees and uh, with the, as the sun would shine, the shadow from that pillar will tell you tell them the time, okay? And it was in degrees. 
360 degrees in a circle. And so when it's at a certain point, they know it's 10 o'clock, another one 11 and so on. They tell the time from that sundial. And so I said, tell him, you choose, what do you want? For the sun to go forward 10 degrees or the sun to return, backtrack, reverse 10 degrees. And Hezekiah told him, well, it's easy to push the sun 10 degrees forward. But let the thing return. Let it return. This is the sign that Hezek King Hezekiah asked for. For the sun to reverse in its tracks 10 degrees. Now, that's, that's not an easy sign. That's not something that Kailal can do or some kind of magician. No, this this heavy, this one. That sun is something else. You see, friends, the sun and the moon in the sky, God gave them to be lights in the firmament of the heaven to be, divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. One of the reasons why the sun and these um, planets and the moon up there is not only for seasons to tell the time, but also for signs, okay? And that's why Hezekiah is asking if a sign can be done with the sun. And uh, in Psalms 19 verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. As this lesson, as this story unfolds, we're going to see how the, the part that the sun and the heavens would play in witnessing for God amongst the pagans back then. Back then. And Isaiah the prophet, 2 Kings 20 verse 11, he cried unto the Lord and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Now that's no minor feet okay that, 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 that's something the sun is 804 million miles diameter that's how wide it is 804 million miles the mass of the sun the weight of the sun is 333,000 times the weight of the earth the mass of the earth and if the sun was hollow one million of planet Earth, one million Earths could fit inside. So this is a huge sign, huge miracle. And it was such that when the scientists in Babylon, that's towards the north of Judah, you know, going northeast where Iraq is today, these, these are the leaders the sun scientists, they all stay here. They worship the sun. That's their God. That's their major God. And as they go about their activities and they see, hey, the sun is going back 10 degrees. This is unheard of. Who is pushing their God back? And so they sent out ambassadors, the princes, of Babylon, high-ranking officials in the kingdom of Babylon. They sent them out to go find out what happened. What happened? How can the sun move back 10 degrees? Second Chronicles 32 verse 31. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. So friends, the ambassadors went out. They look, they go and ask the surrounding nations, hey, what happened? Did anything happen? How come this son moved back? And then the, the reports come filtering back to them. Oh, there was a king, the king of Judah, Hezekiah. He got sick and then his Lord decided to heal him again and uh, allow him to continue his life. And he asked for a sign and that was it. 
His God pushed the sun back 10 degrees. Who? So now they're curious. They want to find out who is the God of Judah. And so they send ambassadors to King Hezekiah to find exactly what's going on. And they want to know about the king of, uh, sorry, the God of Judah. Because now they know that their God is inferior to the God of heaven. Isaiah 39 verse 1, at that time, Merodech Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Verse 2, and Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. And so, friends, when these ambassadors came to King Hezekiah, the thing that's on their mind is to find out about the God of Hezekiah. And instead of preaching to them, Instead of witnessing to them and raising God's profile, he starts showing them all their silver and their gold. All his silver and gold, all his spices, all his treasures. He's like he forget God again once he's better. And, uh, and so, you know, it's like an ego trip. And so God sent the prophet Isaiah unto King Hezekiah, verse 3, and said unto him, What said these men? From whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Now judgment going to come on Hezekiah. Behold, the day is come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so, friends, because he never took the opportunity to glorify God, this is the judgment of God. All the gold and the silver and the treasures that he was showing off to the ambassadors of Babylon, from Babylon, would be taken out. You see, these ambassadors, when they didn't hear anything about Hezekiah's God, and then they see all the treasures and all that, hmm, you know, they start getting ideas. And this was the same, very same gold and silver. A few generations later, down the line, when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to attack Jerusalem, he already knew, he already knew it from these ambassadors. The reports were there. He had this much gold, this much silver. All these are in the palace there. So he knew what was there. And he took it all away, fulfilling this prophecy given through the prophet Isaiah. And the eunuchs that went, that were taken away in captivity to Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is about four or five generations later from King Hezekiah, this was also fulfilled. You see, friends, they were taken by force, God allowed it, to Babylon to go and share the light to Babylon. You see, if Hezekiah would have done his job, if he would have preached to the ambassadors and go and do Bible study with the king of Babylon, you know, these poor eunuchs, these eunuchs 
would not have had to go over by force later on in, in chains. They only did it because Hezekiah did not do his job. You see, friends, we are called to be witnesses. We are called to give glory to God. You find this in Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall they there be after me. So friends, we are to witness for the true God. And if we close the mouth here, Jesus will close his mouth also. He will not, he'll be ashamed of us before his heavenly father. Also in Isaiah 43 verse 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him, created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And friends, another lesson we can learn here is the deceitfulness of the human heart. Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Under threat of invasion, Hezekiah is praying to God, Lord, destroy the enemies, please. Save us for your glory. However, when the danger is taken away, and when he has the opportunity to glorify God, and then he starts showing off his treasure. So this way he slipped up and he did not seize the opportunity. All right, let's move on. So after the judgment is pronounced on King Hezekiah, that um, the city will be destroyed, the gold will be carried away, but it will not happen in his days but in the days of his descendants, he actually was happy. He said, oh, good. So it's not, so nothing's going to happen in my day. I'll have a peaceful end. Hmm. Uh, Isaiah 39 verse 8. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. He said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. So King Hezekiah lived out the rest of his 15 extra years in peace. Mm. And uh, by the way, when Hezekiah was told that he was about to die, we're going back a bit now, uh, that time he did not have a son. He did not have an heir. And maybe that's one of the reasons he asked the Lord to know, he asked the Lord to extend his life. And it was during those 15 years that Manasseh was born. That's Hezekiah's son. And this was the most notorious king of all. He was the worst king of all. His antique sacrificing little children, he filled Jerusalem with blood. Hmm. That's how cruel this king was. And so we see the wisdom of God. If Hezekiah had submitted and just go in peace, you know, before Manasseh was born, Israel, I mean, Jerusalem would have been spared a lot of hardship and sorrow. But anyway, so now he say, oh, good is the word of the Lord. I'll have a peaceful end. So God tell Isaiah, Isaiah, enough, leave him. He's in his own world. Go direct to the people now. Enough of the king. Let's go to the people. And we find that in Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2, and verse 3. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You see, Israel, I mean Judah, is Israel has already, the ten tribes, the northern kingdom has already been taken captive by the Assyrians. And so Judah is next. This is the remaining part now. 
the kingdom of Judah, the last stand, and uh, the, the under threat, you know, a few generations later, Judah would also be destroyed and the people taken to Babylon. So everyone, you know, they all are living in a sort of fear, climate of fear that the end is coming. Similar to our day, we know, even the people who don't know the Bible, they know something's gone wrong with this planet. The end is nigh. Just by the things that are happening, the strange kind of events that are happening, the wars, the plagues, the pestilence and earthquakes, you know, signs are showing up with great frequency. They know we're coming to an end. So the same thing God tell the people of Judah through Isaiah is reaching out to us today. The message is the same for us. Comfort, comfort ye my people, God says. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Friends, as we come to the end of this world, the best, the top priority thing we can do now, prepare your character for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. If we've been following crooked kind of roads, make it straight now. Straighten yourself up now. According to the word of the Lord. Okay, This is the time now. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Friends, the valleys of our life, the things we look down upon, communion with God, worship, studying the Bible, prayer, all these valleys need to be lifted up now so that you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. The mountains in our life, you know, relationships, uh, material wealth, all these mountains that come between us and God, all these hills need to be brought down low to its proper level. And the crooked shall be made straight. Isaiah 40 verse 5, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Friends, even though this world is going down, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. If we ask the question, what is the glory of the Lord? Okay. What is God's glory? His glory is his character. His character of love. That's his glory. Okay. The glory of the Lord can also be translated as his laws, his commandments because they are a written transcript of God's character. Okay? All this shall be revealed in the last days, the darker it yet for this world, the light will shine brighter. Okay? So, God's glory is the time now to have his character. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. This is a book by Ellen White. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Friends, as we come to the end of time, this is the time now where we cleanse ourselves from sin through confession and repentance. We take on the character of Christ. That's what Christ is waiting for. That's the only thing that is holding up the show. The beast is in place to play his part. The image of the beast is also fulfilled. And... The signs are happening all around us. The only thing left is for God's people to get their act together and play their part. That's where the holdup is. Romans 8 verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Friends, 
There's a lot of suffering. A lot of people are waiting for Jesus to come. The whole creation is groaning. Okay? And the only thing that will bring relief is when Jesus returns. And Romans 8 verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. When God will have a people display his character in their lives, then Christ can come or will come. As we close off, Isaiah 40 verse 6 to verse 8, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Friends, that's the reality of life. Our existence in this earth is very temporary, just like the grass. Any glory that we have is just like the flower, here today, gone tomorrow. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. Verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Friends, our only hope, our redemption is tied up with Jesus Christ, the word. Okay. You see, the word of God, you can say that's the Bible. That's his written word. The word in flesh, that's Jesus Christ. He's also the word. And that alone is what is everlasting in this earth. Everything around us will, it will pass away. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Everything will pass away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Friends, and the good news is that when Jesus, the word, is in our lives, in our hearts, we also, we also shall stand forever. And this is the hope. This is the light at the end of the tunnel, that when you have a relationship with Christ, very personal relationship where you become one with him. You also, we also can stand forever because the word of God stands forever. So that's our presentation for today. May the Lord bless each one of you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word in that it can be a light for us in this dark world. I pray for all those listening in that uh, whatever they are facing, trials, sickness, whatever problems they might have, we ask for your healing upon each one. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.